Jacob and his sons were herders. They herded sheep. And the sheep had to, had to be moved at times. And so we pick up the story here. The sheep had been moved, and the, and the sons had all gone except for Joseph. He got to stay home. They were all uh, out, and apparently Jacob was a little concerned as to what might be going on. He wanted to know, hadn't heard a report back, and who better to send to get that report than the one that you know will tell the truth no matter what, especially if it's not a good report. He had already proven that he was willing to tell on his brothers. And so he sent Joseph in his coat of many colors out to find out about his brothers. When he got where they were supposed to be, they were not there. They had moved on, and someone told him where they were, And as he was approaching them, they began to see Joseph. They saw him a long way off. Now, remember, we were just reading that they hated him. I mean, they, like, hated him three times over and were jealous of him. I think it's safe to say they didn't like Joseph. They didn't like him even a little bit. And now he's been sent to check on them. And with a coat of many colors, it wasn't like camouflage. They could see him coming a long ways off. And they spotted him. And you can almost imagine the conversation that's going on between the brothers. Here comes the coat of many colors. Daddy's favorite. You could add a whole lot to that. It could go on and on, and I'm sure that it did. As they grumbled about Joseph, wonder what he's coming to do now. Wonder what he'll go tattle to dad about now. And then one of them says, I want to kill him. And another one agreed. The next thing you know, almost all of them agree except for the oldest brother, Reuben. And he said, let's don't kill him. Let's don't do that. Not a good idea. But there is an empty well over here. How about if we just chuck him in it? And that's where we pick up the story in the 23rd verse. It says that when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore. They didn't ask for it. He didn't give it freely. They stripped him of it and threw him in a pit. And the idea behind the pit was Reuben thought, I'll come back and I'll let him go and send him home to daddy and save his life. But Reuben had other chores to take care of. While he was off doing chores, the the other brothers sat down to eat. And no more than they sat down to eat, and they spot a caravan of traders coming through. And one of them said, in fact, I think it was Judas said, you know, killing him is really not a good idea. That would be kind of a bad thing. Duh. (laughs) I think it would be too. But he says, I think it's a bad idea. Why don't we sell him as if that would be better? And so we pick it up here in the 28th verse. The Midianite traders were passed by, and they drew Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. End of story. He's gone. Reuben comes back. There's a problem. What are they going to tell their dad? Somebody comes up with the bright idea to kill a goat, dip the coat in blood, and send his coat back to their dad, back to their father. Unbelievable. Unbelievable that brothers would do this to another brother. But here we find it in the verse 32. It says, And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it's your son's robe or not. How disassociated can you be? They didn't even claim him as a brother when he's assumed dead. They hated him so much even to the grieving father. There's some folks, they, they flat didn't like him. They were angry with him, so much so that they wouldn't even claim him as their brother in supposed death. And now they've committed not only kidnapping, taking his cloak from him, and now they've sold him into slavery. In the 36th verse, we see that the uh, Midianites... It says, meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. 
Up until this point, Joseph had it all. Think about a young man who's the favorite son. It names that out. And I want to get this out there right quick. If you're a mother, a father, a grandfather, a grandmother, or ever plan to be a parent, you can't do much worse than to pick a favorite. This is a horrible thing that was done. Jacob was a terrible father. Just want to put that out there. God used him. God changed his name. God did great things through him. But it kind of follows the line of Abraham and Isaac and now Jacob. And Jacob, just be honest with you, he was a terrible father. You don't do that to your children, ever. But he chose a favorite son all along. Now, Joseph had a can't-miss future. In that society, the oldest son would get the largest share of everything. But I will guarantee you being a favorite son meant that you were going to get a large share of something. His future was set. He was going to do okay. Also, Joseph wore the cool clothes. He might have been the only one in his community that had a coat of many colors. His father was wealthy, and I'll guarantee you that all of his buddies wanted to come over to his house to play whatever video games he had or army or whatever they played. Uh, but I'll guarantee you that everybody wanted to come and hang out with Joseph. And on Friday or Saturday night, Jacob probably let Joseph, where he had never let any of the other sons, take his best horse and chariot to town to cruise up and down through town uh, trying to pick up girls or hanging out with his buddies or whatever he was doing. Uh, that was Joseph. He had everything. Everything his father could give him, he had. Joseph was not perfect. We've already seen that of him. And God uses imperfect people to do his work. We see it all through the Bible. And here, God has picked Joseph. We can see that when he began to dream, dream why God had chosen Joseph. Joseph was willing to say the hard things, the unpopular things. What he had said about his dreams were not untrue. They were the dreams he had had. And yet it created angst. It created anger at him. But he was willing to say and do it. Maybe he was just young and dumb, but he was still willing to say them. And God chose him, and I think probably in part had something to do with this because we see where it served him well later on. God began to reveal things to him. He revealed things to Joseph that he didn't understand, but he trusted God. You know why he trusted God? You remember the un imperfect father that he had? Well, so was his grandpa and his great-grandpa Abraham. But they had trusted God. They had followed God, and he counted to them as faith. And they had shared that faith down through the generations. And so through the stories that his father told him, he knew of God. He trusted God. He had faith in God. He had seen the evidence of what God, every step that his father took was a limp in front of him and a reminder that he had wrestled with God and God had changed his life. Joseph was taught to understand God. He began to reveal himself to him. Joseph, in a moment's time, lost his tunic, lost his coat of many colors. The most precious thing in his life, freedom, which he didn't know, and then his tunic. He lost his father and support. He lost his status at a moment's notice. Status that he didn't earn. When Joseph went to town, everybody knew who Joseph was. And he could ride through town in his dad's chariot or with his dad, and he was recognized as the boy with the coat of many colors. And that boy's got money, and he's got status, and he's got everything. And it was gone just like that, lost, taken away from him. But he never earned it. It was never really his because of anything he had done. God had his hand and his eye on Joseph from that point forward. And you can see where God spends the next 13 years preparing 
Joseph for what he was born for, what he was chosen for. He had lived 17 years to this time, and God spends another 13 years preparing Joseph. Joseph was now headed to Potiphar's house, and God begins to test and bless him at the same time. He shows up at Potiphar's house. What happens? Potiphar almost immediately recognizes there's something different about this guy. He gets things done. They happen, and he takes care of it, and he organizes, and his house ran well when Joseph ran it, and he put him in charge of his whole house until his wife tempted and went after. And we see this. Things start to go a little bit better, and all of a sudden, they're jerked away from him, and now he's headed to prison. And that's not a nice place to go. It's not, it's not sanitized at all. There's no wipes there. There's no uh, you know, little machines where you can sanitize your hands. This is a nasty place. What happens there? God puts him in charge of all of the prisoners. Joseph, almost in spite of himself, keeps rising to the top. You know why? He got up every day and did what needed to be done. He had heard the stories. He had had the dreams. But here he is. And I just wonder, as I look over the crowd here this morning, I wonder what's going on in your life. I wonder what kind of storms are hitting you. I wonder what you're dealing with. And I wonder if you see it as what happened to Joseph. You see, not only was Joseph dealing for 13 years with the worst time of his life, but God was blessing him in that. He was teaching him. He was learning who he was. Oh, he was a dreamer when he got there. He knew about God, but now he was learning about God. I can only tell you of my own life. I can't tell you of yours. But I wonder what just went through your mind about what you're dealing with right now. I know in the first service, this sermon was for someone, more than someone, and there's no doubt in a group this size, it's for others. And first of all, it was for me. You see, I understand just a little bit about this. Several years ago, um, life was great. And then all of a sudden, in about a two to three year period, I lost three jobs. I didn't do anything wrong. Two of them was laid off from. Another one I was fired from. Later found out that there was some nonsense going on in the ownership, and it cost me a job. It was nothing I had done. It hurt my family. It hurt my family greatly. Now suddenly we don't drive quite as nice a car as we did. Now we live in a smaller house all of a sudden. Why? I didn't know. It didn't make sense. I didn't understand. My daughter had become a type 1 diabetic overnight. Five years later, has thyroid cancer, and it doesn't make sense to me. And life just seems like it's rolling over the top of us, like a wave out of the ocean, time after time. Things hit, and you think you're getting over it and getting through it, and the next thing hits, and the next thing hits. And I realized... <clears throat> even though it felt like it would never stop, that God was in control. And then I had a heart attack. Just out of the blue. Other physical issues. And it didn't make sense. And I didn't understand. But I can tell you what happened during that time. I realized I wasn't in control, and I couldn't fix it. But I knew I served the one that did. And I got on my knees and began to pray, and God called me to preach. When I said, God, I just want to do more for you, that was not my plan, and that was not what I was praying about or thought about. Standing in front of you was never in my plans, but it was in God's plan. And when I began to turn my life over to him as a Christian and to release things and allow him to dictate to me, son, this is what I want. Son, this is what I need from you. It was life change in dramatic ways. Simply said, <laughs> he didn't call me because of a talent. He called me because I made myself available. 
I said, God, whatever it is, whatever you require of me, I'm willing to do it. I just know that, God, I can't control what's going on. It's out of control. I don't know how to fix it. I can't fix it. There's nothing I can do. I can only get up tomorrow and take care of what needs to be taken care of tomorrow. But I can't control it. I'm not in control. And I, I begin to realize that I would have told you before that, but then I experienced it, and I begin to understand. God began to bless. And yes, financially, he has blessed. Oh, it's, I'm not rich. I don't want anybody to think that. But he has blessed. But I probably look at that blessing a little different than I did a few years ago. It's his. And he gives and he takes away. And if he takes away the next time, I understand whose it is. And listen, that doesn't mean it'll make it easier. It just means that I know. I know who is in control, and it's not me. I wish I could tell you, and by the way, it's just not a financial blessing. Much, much more than that. The blessing that I'm able to come and worship with you all, whether I'm up here or down there or wherever it is, to be able to come into the house of God and worship Him freely is a blessing. And I don't take it for granted, and I hope you don't either. God began to bless in our family. My children grew up and seen some of those things going on. They, they watched that. They've both gotten married. And now I have an extra son and a daughter. God is blessed. Oh, but he wasn't done. I got three grandbabies. Oh, man, that's a blessing, let me tell you. If you haven't experienced grandbabies, whoo, when that little old girl crawls up in my lap and lays one of them open mouth slobber-filled kisses on the side of my head, it just doesn't get any better than that. And that little bitty baby, I hold him. But let me tell you something, there's miracles involved in that because my daughter who became a diabetic and then had thyroid cancer. We didn't know if she'd be able to have children. And today, she's got a little one-year-old, blonde-haired, I wouldn't call him a wild man, but man, he don't stop. I mean, Theo is on the go. And she just announced this week that my fourth grandbaby's on the way. God blesses. And let me tell you, I am blessed. That is not small. Those are miracles and God has blessed me. I've been through some hard times. We've been through some hard times. And we may go through some more. I don't know what God has planned. And Joseph didn't either. And you don't either. I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know what's going on in your life. But I can tell you who is control, in control. If you're a Christian, it's a matter of releasing that control to him. If you're here this morning and you're unsaved... Giving God control of your life, turning over all of that to him and allowing him to take it and make it and mold it into something is incredible. It's amazing to watch. I've seen him do it, not just on, in my own life. I wish I could tell you that I've been faithful and not one time have I ever failed him, but that's just not true. But I can tell you that not one time has he ever failed me. I can look back and I can see God's life, hand in my life. He taught me some things. I'm a little more patient than I used to be. That was a painful lesson. I got a little more tolerance than I used to have. I mean, not quite as rigid and strong and uh, stuck in like, you know, Tony's beliefs. I want to learn more about God's beliefs, God's message. Oh, and let me tell you about a tough one. He taught me about forgiveness. <laughs> oh, he taught me about forgiveness. I'll never forget the, uh, the, the employee that I had that, that was really coming after me and trying to cause me some trouble. And one night after all the employees had gone home, God sent me to her area to pray over her. In spite of whatever happened, God sent me there to pray for her. Oh, forgiveness. Joseph learned it, and if you haven't, it can be a painful thing to learn. 
but God will bring you to it. He'll help you through it. He'll bring you to it if you'll allow him to. Imagine if Joseph hadn't forgiven. How different the story would be. So I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what God's trying to do in your life. I don't know what's rolling over you. But I can tell you this. Don't roll over and quit. Imagine if Joseph had given up in that pit and he, he went to Egypt and gave up and never stood up and went and put the next foot in front of the next foot, the next step, the next step, the next day, and worked his way back up and through multiple times. He would have died, an, died a slave and buried in an unnamed grave in Egypt, and we have never heard of him. But what did he do? He got up and did what had to be done every day and trusted God for 13 long years. God has plans for your life. I don't know what it looks like right now, but God has plans for your life, and he's working. Are you allowing him to work? I don't know if you're here this morning and unsaved. He wants to work in your life. If you're here and saved this morning, it's a matter of releasing it to him. So often as Christians, we try to fix it for God. He don't need your help. That might surprise some of us, but he's quite capable if we'll turn it over to him and allow him to work in our lives. So often when I've tried to fix my life, boy, what a mess. I am good at making messes. But stepping back, And allow God to fight those battles is some of the hardest things I've ever done. But boy, does he fight them. And when God moves, he moves in incredible ways. Surrender it to God. Joseph had to surrender to God. He had to allow. He had to wait. You see, even in the prison, he had risen to the top, but he was still a prisoner. And now we find that two of Pharaoh's uh, close people, one the worker, a cupbearer and a baker, were uh, in trouble. And he interpreted their dreams and asked the one that was going to be restored to remember him when he went back to work for Pharaoh. The dreams uh, did come true. One was killed, the other was restored. And for two years... Now Joseph sets in prison. He asked, he was forgotten. But Pharaoh has a dream. He has a series of dreams. And he begins to tell his wise men, and that's their job is to interpret these dreams, and they can't. They don't have a clue what they mean. And all of a sudden, the cupbearer remembers. Oh, yeah, there was this guy. And they run and get Joseph, clean him up. He was a mess. But for 13 years, God had been preparing for this time. Even before that, he was dreaming dreams, and God was interpreting them. And so now when he stands in front of Pharaoh, we don't read that Joseph was scared. They could kill him, but what else? I mean, throw him in prison, he was already there. So, and by the way, when he was a little boy, he learned to tell the truth in spite of who liked it or who didn't. And now it's time for him to tell the real truth. And he does. Explains the dream to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is fairly impressed with it. And we find in Genesis 41, verses 37 through 45, this is what Pharaoh thought about what Joseph had just told him about the seven years of plenty and the seven years of uh, famine and what needed to be done to uh, save up for it. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Even Pharaoh, a wicked man, recognized the Spirit of God in Joseph. And Just think about this. Thirteen years in prison, in captivity, and the Spirit of God was still in Joseph. He got up every day and went and did the right thing. It doesn't matter what happens in your life. It matters how you react to it. And If you get up, get on your knees, get in your Bible, talk to God, let him speak to you, 
you just keep going. It doesn't matter what's happening to you. You keep your eye on the prize. And this is what Joseph has done. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot, and they called out before him, Bow the knee. Thus he set him, thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up a hand or a foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Jimbob. No, it was Zapheth Panea. And he gave him in marriage Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. And if you go on and study this story and go, there's archaeology that's found the pits that were dug to search to uh, save the grain up, and they did it all through the land of Egypt. He put Egypt in charge, uh, or he put Joseph in charge of Egypt. And when it came after the seven years, and they went through the famine, if you read on in the story, it says that Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. In other words, there were city states. While it was all Egypt, Pharaoh was just kind of in charge. But coming out the backside of this, Pharaoh was in charge. God blessed Joseph, and he was a part of this for 70 years. He died at 110. We'll see that in a moment. It's incredible what God blessed Joseph with. And it all goes back to this. What if Joseph had quit when he lost his tunic, the most important thing in his life? And as I look across the crowd this morning, I wonder, have you been challenged with losing the most important thing in your life? And if you have, have you laid down and quit? And would you? That's a question to answer. Because God may have to take the most important thing in your life so that he can prepare you for something even bigger. He would have never sat on the throne if he had laid down and quit over a coat of many colors. Lose a tunic, gain a throne. What's God trying to do in your life this morning? Where are you at this morning? Have you turned your life over to him this morning? Have you given everything to him? Do you trust him? Do you truly trust God with your life? Oh, he has incredible things to do, but they typically come at a price. They're not easy. They're just worth it. Joseph saved his whole family by being persecuted by his family. And he took it. He really didn't have a choice, but he could he did. He could have laid down. He could have quit. Had he quit over his coat of many colors, How different would the story look? God's looking for a few people that are willing to not quit. They're willing to get up and take the next step. It doesn't matter that you got knocked down. It doesn't matter that you lost whatever it was, that it was taken from you. What matters is that you get up and you keep going. You worship God. You get in his word. You get on your knees. You give him your life. And allow him to do a work. Because he has a plan, then on the back side will make sense. Most likely on this side it won't. It certainly didn't to Joseph. He lived a pampered life up until it was taken from him. And then for 13 years, he was in a dungeon. I don't think any of us are faced with that, but we might be. Are we allowing God to work in our lives? Are you allowing God to work in your life? What is next? What's on the horizon? What are you dealing with today? 
Have you given him control? Keep your eye on the prize. I love this about Joseph. Joseph started at the bottom and ended at the top. But he never forgot who he was and where he came from. In Hebrews 11, 22, it says, by faith. Get those first two words. By faith. Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions for concerning his bones. He's been dreaming again. God's been revealing things. There's going to be an exodus. He just didn't realize it would be about three or 400 years. But God's revealed to him. And here were his true instructions to his brothers. In Genesis 50, verses 24 through 26, Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, this is great-grandpa, to Isaac, grandpa, and to dad, Jacob. He'll bring us out to that land. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel, as his brothers, swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Chris, if you would come. Even with all of his success, he had gone from the bottom. You couldn't be any lower than he was to the top, as high as you could go without being Pharaoh. Even with all of his success, Joseph never forgot who he was and where his home was. And in the end, God gave him one more dream, a dream of going back home. He said there will be an exodus out of Egypt, and he wanted to be a part of the exodus going home. And I would just say this. There's a soon coming exodus out of this world by Christians, and you don't want to miss it. In fact, you want to be a part of it. You want to be assured that you're going to be a part of it. 